Good morning. Good morning. Well, to be honest with you, it was nice to get away for a couple of weeks. And to be honest with you, it's great to be back as well. The only problem with going away is all the work that piles up when you're gone. When I turned on my computer yesterday, there were only 133 emails waiting for me. So the good news is uh, maybe about a third of those, or maybe only a quarter of those needed any response. But the most interesting email came to me from Paris, France, from an Episcopal priest there. Never heard of her before, probably will never hear from her again. An Episcopal priest by the name of Haley Jacobson. And she was inquiring about a baptism that took place back in 1973. A young woman, or probably an infant uh, at that time, Angela Cochino. Never heard of her before, but it had all the specifics. It had her full name, it had the date of the baptism, and even had the pastor's name, Paul Peterson. She just wanted to verify that the baptism had taken place because Angela had joined the American Cathedral, an Episcopal church in Paris. Now why do I share that with you? Because today, God's people gather around the globe to worship our Lord and our Savior. And may the Word of God, wherever it's preached, far and wide, be blessed on this holy day. Please rise as we begin our worship. Let us call the name of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. I invite you to kneel if you're able. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, the poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temple and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy and bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Almighty and Eternal God. Your Son Jesus triumphed over the Prince of Demons and freed us from bondage to sin. Help us to stand firm against every assault of Satan and enable us always to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I... I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who are you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who, whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. The word of the Lord. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of, second book of Corinthians. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accord with the scripture, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we spoke, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus Christ will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence.
and will bring into us. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, is it, grace as it extends to more and more people may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slightly momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly intent in which we live in it is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the third chapter. <clears throat> Jesus went home, and the crowds came together again, so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of the Lord. We have to stop and think just how remarkable what we are doing here this morning is. Do we ever stop and think just how strange, and dare I go so far as to say, just how bizarre it is that we're gathered here to worship 
the God of the cross. Well, who's that man that thinks he's a prophet? Well, I wonder if he's got something up his sleeve. Where is he from? And who is his daddy? There's rumors he even thinks himself a king of a kingdom of paupers, simpletons, and rogues. The whores all seem to love him, and the drunks propose a toast. And they say, surely God is with us. Well, surely God is with us. They say, surely God is with us today. Who's that man who says he's a preacher? Well, he must be. He's disturbing all our peace. Where does he get off? And what is he hiding? And every word he says, those fools believe. Who could move a mountain? Who would love their enemy? Who could rejoice in pain? And then turn the other cheek. And still say, surely God is with us. Well, surely God is with us. Who will say, surely God is with us today. They say, surely God is with us. Well, surely God is with us. They say, surely God is with us today. Tell me, who's that man? They made him a prisoner. They tortured him and nailed him to a tree. Well, if he's so bad, who did he threaten? Did he deserve to die between two thieves? See the scars and touch his wounds. He's rich, risen flesh and blood. Now the sinners have become the saints, and the lost have all come home. And they say, surely God is with us. Surely God is with us. Well, surely God is with us. They say, surely God is with us today. Today. They say, surely God is with us. Well, surely God is with us. They say, surely God is with us today. So wrote and so sang the late Rich Mullins. Do we realize, do we realize just what a strange God we've gathered to worship this morning? He's as strange as they come. And the problem is, because most of us are lifelong, or at least long-time Christians, we tend to forget just how bizarre Jesus was when he appeared here on earth in human form. Well, let's turn to our sermon text, to our gospel lesson this morning. And let's listen again to what Mark has to say. Then Jesus went home. Now note when it says Jesus went home, he's no longer living in Nazareth. He's moved to Capernaum. Capernaum has become his home base, if you will. And the crowd came together again. How many were there that day? Forty. 50, 80, 100. Mark doesn't tell us. But the crowd is so large, as we will see, that Jesus' mother and his brothers, and maybe even his sisters, they can't even squeeze in to where Jesus is sitting. So they could not even eat, we're told. And when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he's gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. And he called them to him, and he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against itself and is divided, 
He cannot stand. His end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Oh, truly, I tell you, Jesus goes on to say, people will be forgiven their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. Now a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and who are my brothers? And looking at those around him, he said, Here are my mother, and here are my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Well, to be honest, this is a challenging text for the preacher, because it would probably take a half dozen sermons or more to do these few short verses, the justice that is there to do. But I don't have that time this morning. So let's try to enter the picture, if you will. I want you to imagine the scene of what took place all those years ago. Was it quiet or loud that day that Mark describes? Were there babies crying in the crowd? And were the sick moaning and groaning as they desperately sought Jesus' touch? And speaking of our Lord, could you hear his stomach growling that day? Remember, he hadn't had anything to eat. Well, Mark sets the scene this way. Then Jesus went home. And again, he's not in Nazareth anymore. Capernaum has become his home base. And the crowd came together there were so many there, so many there to listen, so many there seeking healing, that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have time to eat. And then did you notice what Mark goes on to say? Now when his family heard about this, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he's gone out of his mind. Another way, in other words, a lot of people there in Capernaum, and it seems that even Jesus' own family, and it seems that Jesus' own mother, Mary, thought that Jesus was now crazy. And did you notice Mark's very careful here in his wording and what Jesus' family came to do to him? They came to force him to come home with them. They came to restrain him they were going to compel him, they were going to take him by the arm, grab him by the elbow, whatever it took to get him away from this madness that seemed to have infected him. So what's going on here? What's happened to Jesus' own family? What's happened even to Mary? Where was her faith that day? And there, dare I say it, had Mary, at least on that day, had she become and done believer? Well, this is early in the stages, in the very early stages of Jesus' public ministry. But already in the early stages of Jesus' public ministry, he was being accused of the most vile kinds of things. His opponents as we will see, they were accusing him of literally being in cahoots, being in league, being in partnership with the prince of demons, with Beelzebub, with the devil or Satan himself. Did you notice Jesus was accused? Where did he get this power? How was it that he was able to cast out demons and do the other miraculous things he did? Many thought it was because he was working with he was working for Satan, the devil himself. 
And make no mistake about it, at this very early stage in Jesus' ministry, he's already encountering violent, violent opposition. I need to demonstrate that to you so that it will strike home. Earlier in Mark chapter 3, at the very beginning of Mark chapter 3, we learn that Jesus' opponents from the first days of his ministry sought to get rid of him. They sought to kill him. They literally wanted to destroy him. Here's what took place earlier in, Ch in Mark chapter 3. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, Come up here. Then he said to him, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to harm? But the congregation was silent, and he looked around at them with anger. And he was grieved at the hardness of their hearts, and he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how they could destroy him. So make no mistake about it. They, the people in Jesus' day, they, they knew there was something very strange about this figure, this man known as Jesus. The likes of which had never walked the earth before. He was far different than the people of old. He was different than Moses. He was different than David. He was different even from the prophets and some of the strange things that they had come to do. Well, let me go back to our sermon text. Let's go back and listen to the accusations leveled against Jesus. And let's see how he responded. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. And Jesus can hear what they said. Well, maybe they whispered it, or maybe they whispered it so loud as that he couldn't avoid hearing what they were saying about him. And so Jesus called them to him, he says, you want to talk about demons? You want to talk about Satan? Okay, shut up and listen, because I've got a lesson to teach you today. How can Satan cast out Satan? What you're accusing me of is illogical. You're out of your mind. It doesn't make any sense. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom isn't going to stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house isn't going to endure. And if Satan rises up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. No, what you're seeing is that his end has come. But mark my words, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, that house can be plundered. So what's Jesus declaring here? He's declaring one of the primary reasons he's appeared here on earth. He's reminding us today even of one of the primary works, one of the primary reasons why he came. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He came literally to plunder Satan's kingdom. He came to set the devil's captives free. And the good news is, that includes even the likes of you and the likes of me. Well, like I said, I can easily preach a half dozen sermons to do this text justice. But there's two more sections I must quickly cover this morning. Picking up at verse 28, Jesus again is speaking. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins, and even whatever blasphemies they utter. 
But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Because they were saying, He has an unclean spirit. Now there's so much going on here in this sermon text. Like I said, I can't do it justice. That paragraph that I just read to you is known these days as the unforgivable sin. And later this summer, most likely when we get to September, we're going to spend an entire hour in our Life of God Bible class talking about these few verses and chewing on what does it mean? What is this unforgivable sin that Jesus is talking about? I'll just leave you with this. A, a Lutheran pastor's brief explanation of what Jesus is talking about. This unforgivable sin is not simple unbelief by one who is uninformed or unfamiliar with the truth about Jesus. Instead, it is the willful rejection of Jesus when one has been confronted with the truth of who he is and what he claims about himself. But like I said, come September, we're going to spend an entire hour looking at this mysterious passage, looking at that unforgivable sin that Jesus tells us about. But I must move on. There's a few more verses for us to consider. And these have everything to do with us gathered here this morning. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. Now a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. But he replied, Who are my mother? And who are my brothers? And looking at those gathered around him, he said, Here are my mother, and here are my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And believe it or not, the strange God that we gather to worship, the crucified God, none other than Jesus Christ our Lord, he considers us his mother and his brother and his sisters. He calls us his mother and his brother and his sisters. For we have gathered to do the first part of the will of God, which is to hear his word. And his word is all about his son. And then to follow in Christ's footsteps when we leave this place. May that be so. In Jesus' name.
Having heard the word of the Lord and what it means for our lives, I invite you to rise and join with me as we confess our faith in the God of the cross. We confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose to Him. He ascended into heaven. And is seated on the right hand of the fathers. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we now continue with the prayer of the church, we will be including Sally Day in one of our later petitions. Sally has been hospitalized and is undergoing tests. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Hear us, Lord, for Jesus' sake. I invite you to kneel if you're able. O oh Lord, you hear our voice in the morning we lay our request before you and wait in expectation. God of mercy. O oh Lord, great is your love, reaching to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Help us to meditate on your unfailing love day and night. We pray this for all the baptized, including those celebrating their new birth this week. Tammy, Kay, and Jenny, God of mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, let all the earth fear you. Let all the peoples of the world revere you. Help us to fear, love, and trust you above all else. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God of mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, may we not fret because of the wicked or be envious of those who do wrong. Like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Help us not to return evil for evil, but to overcome it with good. God of mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you are a refuge for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. Arise, lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. God of mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, hear the sighs and cries of those in anguish. Answer them according to your boundless mercy. Sustain those who are sick and hurting, including Paula, Melody, Gail, Brian, Pat, Scott, Nypenny, Kelly, Dane, David, Tim, Michelle, Kathy, Ben, Bob, Jean, Don, Sheila, Carol, Jolene, Dennis, Jeanette, Gertrude, Liz, Larry, Ye, Angela, and Thaddy. God of mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, where would we be without you? Apart from you, we have no good thing. Help us to worship you and you alone all our days. God of mercy, hear our prayer. O God, do not keep silent. Hear and answer the prayers of all who call to you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We now continue with the gathering of the offering.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks for grace. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We now enter into one of the great mysteries of our faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them to drink, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready.
the last Sunday, probably about 12 or 1,300 miles to the west of here, a couple of hours to the west of Salt Lake City, Elaine, Jenny, and I, we worshiped at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Elko, Nevada. And at the end of the service, the pastor announced they were having a special summer Bible class. They were going to be reading and discussing C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters. And I thought, oh, we're doing something similar here at our Savior's beginning today. We're going to be looking at this little book, and everyone who attends the class when we're done in September will get to take home a copy of Jesus Said What? And as I referenced during the sermon, later on, towards the end of our study in September, we'll look at what Jesus had to say to us today about that unforgivable sin. But we'll get started on this uh, book today, Jesus Said What? Momentarily. So if you're able to stay, we'll be doing so in our Life of God class at the fellowship room. But we close out our worship now. Go in peace and serve the Lord. <laughs>